What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mash and Drum Whiskey Room. I am Jason C. And today we have a very, very special bottle. Now, this may be another revived bourbon brand, but the name on this bottle is one that you may or may not know. A name with well-aged history rooted in the heart of bourbon country 175 years in the making. That name is McBrayer, and today McBrayer Legacy Spirits has revived a family recipe that has been stored away for more than 150 years. A lot of us talk about the incredible history in bourbon royalty that is Colonel E.H. Taylor. Well, meet the Colonel's competition. Want to know more? Stay right here on the Mash and Drum. All right, so we're gonna get into a little bit of history here. So for all you geeks out there, buckle in, uh, pour a dram if it's a, you know, a reasonable hour. <laughs> and if not, uh, I'll leave a timestamp uh, below so you can jump ahead to the review. So back in 1821, William Harrison McBrayer, W.H. McBrayer, one of 11 children was born to a family of Scottish descent who were among the first settlers in Anderson County, Kentucky. Displaying an entrepreneurial spirit early on, W.H. went into the family store business at the age of 18, eventually buying out his brothers to become the sole proprietor. A successful cattle buyer as well, he ran the store for the next 30 years. The McBrayer family legacy was known in the region for making the perfect batch of whiskey. WH continued the family tradition, purchasing the beautiful land with winding banks around Anderson County Cedar Creek. In 1844, it became the home of WH McBrayer's Distillery No. 44 under the label WH McBrayer Handmade Sour Mash Whiskey. Now in 1848, his second cousin opened distillery number 125, known as the J.H. McBrayer Distillery, along Hammonds Creek. Now as the distilling dynasties began to form, the McBrayer name became known for making some of the highest quality whiskey and bourbon out of Kentucky. On top of that, he was elected Anderson County's first judge. W.H. became known simply as the judge. Now this nickname would follow him for the rest of his life, a reflection of his role as a beloved community leader. He went on to be elected to the Kentucky State Senate, but a busy political career never stopped him from building his whiskey business and further and further on he went. In 1856, he expanded operations uh, and at the advice of his wife, Mary, the judge made the decision to rename his distillery Cedar Brook. Now Cedar Brook would eventually grow to be a world renowned brand with every bottle proudly displaying the McBrayer family name as a sign of the best possible quality. During the Civil War, the Cedar Brook Distillery continued to thrive while word of McBrayer's bourbon spread throughout the country. Judge McBrayer's success prompted him to partner with T.P. Rippey on distillery number 112 in Tyrone, Kentucky. That's right, you may know that Rippey name from the beginnings of Wild Turkey. Later, he sold his shares to T.P. Rippey, and in 1870, J.H. McBrayer, his second cousin, established a new distillery in New Market, Kentucky, as Old McBrayer Distillery that would be purchased by the judge a few years later. After that, his whiskey reputation rose to new levels in 1873, winning a gold medal at the Universal Exhibition in Vienna. It is said, it is said, he turned the crowned head in Europe from Scotch to Kentucky bourbon. Three years later, McBrayer's Bourbon also took home a gold medal at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition, which was America's first World Fair. Now with that type of global recognition, the brand and W.H. McBrayer put Kentucky Bourbon on the international map. Now to carry on the family's birthright in distilling, he gifted his nephew an adopted son, here we go, Charles M. Dedman. That's right, Charles Mortimer Dedman, the great-great-grandfather of Dixon Dedman, with the land and funding needed to establish his very own distillery and bourbon brand called Kentucky Owl. Starting to see this crazy legacy now, aren't you? 
Soon after, he guided another longtime employee, another name you might find familiar, W.B. Saffle, in establishing his own distillery. Uh, both the C.M. Deadman and W.B. Saffle distilleries were created to proudly carry McBrayer's Kentucky bourbon legacy forward. As you know, W.B. Saffle was a brand revived by Campari through Wild Turkey with the help of Jimmy and Eddie Russell. After purchasing the old McBrayer distillery, W.H. McBrayer sold it to W.W. Johnson in Cincinnati, who later sold it to E.H. Taylor in 1885. Now, Old McBrayer became another premium brand, which was purchased by the American Medicinal Company, uh, who was one of the few distilleries who could sell whiskey and bourbon during Prohibition. Uh, they became national distillers, and they marketed the brand during Prohibition. In 1888, the judge passed away at 67. His impact would influence generations to come. One admirer recalls Judge McBrayer was endowed with a noble mind, a clear, far-seeing brain, and a strong, generous heart. Following his death, the judge's son-in-law, D.L. Moore, and his three grandchildren took over the distillery, but this did not come without, you know, a little share of controversy, like a lot of things did in whiskey back in those days. In his will, the judge requested that his name be stricken from the distillery business after three years. With the McBrayer name valued at over $200,000 at the time, uh, the family appealed to the state Supreme Court and the will was overruled. DL and the grandchildren were allowed to keep the McBrayer name associated with the bourbon, which was a big deal. So now after running Cedarbrook for over 10 years, DL Moore and his family sold the distillery to Julius Kessler and the Whiskey Trust. Now, building upon its reputation, Julius Kessler branded Cedar Brook as the most famous brand in the world, which carried both Cedar Brook and W.H. McBrayer's name right there on the label. But of course, as with most distilleries at the time, Cedar Brook was shut down in 1922 due to prohibition. Only a few carefully preserved bottles, faded historical documents, and handwritten recipes remain tucked away in Kentucky and around the world, patiently awaiting rediscovery. Well, that time is here, and to honor the judge and his world-famous distilled products, the McBrayers have resurrected the family business with a new Kentucky bourbon. In 2016, McBrayer Legacy Spirits was created, built, and developed by W.G., or Bill McBrayer IV. He knew about the blended old McBrayer whiskey product made by national distillers in the 1970s that was bottled in Cincinnati. And as a kid, his dad used to tell the story that he would hand it out to his customers around the holidays, and they would just hand it right back because... Well, it was pretty terrible at that time. After tracing the history of the brands, he found out the trademarks had expired. Now remember, Beam bought National Distillers in 1983 and just kind of let the Cedar Brook and the McBrayer name trademarks just run out. So in 2013, he re-registered the family brand trademarks and told his wife, honey, it looks like I'm getting into the bourbon business. And there we have it, the first bottling of McBrayer Legacy Spirits. Okay, what's in the bottle? So what I love about this so far is beyond the story is the that this isn't just source Barton Beam or MGP like we see a lot today. This is a contract distilled proprietary mash bill that was discovered on an old letter to the man himself, Colonel E.H. Taylor. On November 10th, 1870, W.H. McBrayer, the judge himself, wrote a handwritten letter to Colonel E.H. Taylor Jr in which he discussed a deal for Taylor to buy some of his bourbon in order to help him make his whiskey tax payment to the federal government. Now, Michael Veach, the legendary whiskey historian, obtained the letter through his work with the Filson Historical Society in Louisville. Now, while the contents of the letter would interest any history buff, on the back of the letter was the mash bill W.H. McBrayer used to make this Kentucky bourbon. So that mash bill that was written on the back of that letter to Colonel E.H. Taylor was 88.4% corn, 5.8% rye, and 5.8% barley. Now, by modern standards, this low malt mash would likely produce a low yield with a high grain flavor. Michael Veach also pointed out that the lower yield may have added flavor to McBrayer's bourbon. Now, it's no secret that whiskey made in the 1800s tastes different from what we drink today. One reason is that pre-prohibition era whiskeys were made using heirloom and heritage grains compared to today where many distillers use industrial grains. Also, as we've seen recently though, we've seen a lot of these heirloom grains being used by craft distilleries. So we've seen bloody butcher corn being used, we've seen you know oats and spelt and a lot of different types of grains being used uh, as well in the craft movement. Now I've mentioned in previous videos that it was common for whiskey to enter the barrel at a low entry proof of usually 90 to 105 to ensure that the product was palatable straight from the barrel, you know, even after only a few years of aging. Now we have seen modern distilleries adopt these low entry proofs in today's market, uh, names like Peerless, Michter's, and also Wilderness Trail. 
Now I bring up Wilderness Trail for a reason, because with their help and the brilliant minds at Wilderness Trail, this legacy brand is now contract distilled there. This is where it came from using heirloom grains grown only a few miles from McBrayer's original distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, to recreate the flavors found in that pre-prohibition era. All right, so that 88.4% corn is actually bloody butcher corn using a sweet mash process cooked with a legacy style yeast. Now Wilderness Trail, you know Dr. Patrick Heist, you know if those guys know, if there's anyone that's gonna know about yeast, it's gonna be those guys. Uh, Dr. Pat Heist specializes in yeast and he knows probably exactly the exact yeast that this bourbon needed to recreate that profile. So this has a low barrel entry proof of 105. It's non-chill filtered and at barrel strength, only 103.6 proof, much like the bourbons of you know pre-prohibition. Now the first edition was a small batch at four years and four months old for a price of about 100 bucks. Now the first batch was sold out, but a second batch is on the way. I've left the link below to join the Legacy Spirits Legacy Club to find out when the next batch is coming, especially if you like what you hear uh, today on how this bourbon exactly tastes. All right guys, so I know I went into a little bit of a deep dive in history there, but that's, that, I mean, come on, that's an incredible story. When you could talk about this guy and how, you know, he, you know, rubbed elbows with Colonel Taylor, the Rippies, W.B. Saffle, you know, the fact that his adopted son was C.M. Deadman, <laughs> who started Kentucky Owl, I mean, if, if the name and the history of it just really piqued my interest. So let's see how it is on the nose. Here we go. Time to taste this stuff. Wow, it's, uh, if any of you guys out there have ever had a, I'm not saying pre-prohibition, that's a little bit tough to, to try to taste, but even a bourbon from the 70s or 80s, even maybe the 60s, there's this very, very strong butterscotch note, like a brown butter note that jumps out of the glass for the most part on those, uh, on those bourbons. And this is all butterscotch, Werther's original candy all day long. Oh man, there's also a nice little dark chocolate note here. There's a nuttiness component to it, which I think is from the Bloody Butcher Corn. Now Bloody Butcher Corn isn't as sweet as yellow corn. So there's a little bit of a nuttier profile that comes through. You definitely get that a little bit here on the nose. But my goodness, there's so much butterscotch, butter pecan. This is the, this is the nose that I look for whenever I try some of these old bourbons and the fact that they're like recreating this, it's pretty, it's pretty spot on. There is a little bit of youth there on the nose. Remember it's four years, four months old, not, you know, super age, but I think working with Wilderness Trail to recreate this legacy Nashville, legacy yeast, I mean, it was pretty, that's, that's another really cool thing about it. It's not just some sourced, you know, some sourced whiskey that we, we see pretty much all the time here now. All right, so brown butter, butter pecan, butter scotch, Werther's original candy, little bit of chocolate. There's that nuttiness component to it. A little bit of uh, like a chocolate covered peanut. There's also a nice hint of a cherry here as it opens up. I, I poured this about 20, 25 minutes ago. Uh, let it open up. A little bit of cherry starting to peek through now with that butterscotch and the nuttiness. Just a really, really inviting nose. All right, let's go for a taste. Here we go, guys. All right, a lot of stuff happened on that first sip. I was trying to, you know, break down really the sweet flavors I was getting. A lot of that butterscotch and cherry, I'm getting a lot more cherry on the palate than I was on the nose. It really comes through. The butterscotch is still there. The Werther's Original Candy. Now this is a very, very low rye um, and also a low barley. So there's not a lot of super heavy spice going on here. I think the sweetness really here and the bloody butcher corn is really the star of the show. Let's go for another sip. Yeah, this is dangerous. So remember that low entry barrel proof going in at 105. And I mean, this, this bottle is, is beautiful. Whoever designed it. Um, I, I definitely love this bottle shape. It's also kind of a throwback, you know, a little bit similar to the old Forrester bottles that we've seen with the little slight little bubble here on top. Love that. Uh, yeah, 103.6 proof going in the barrel at 105. So it lost a little bit. You know, it does carry a little bit of spice still, which I like, which is probably more the youth, I think, rather than the, you know, the lack of rye or even that little bit of rye that's in there. Let's go for another sip. If you like a long, 
lingering finish like I do. That would probably be the one, you know, critique of this that I would have. It doesn't have a very long finish, but again, they're recreating a pre-prohibition style type bourbon, which if you think about that aspect of it, it definitely hits that mark because at 103.6 proof, you're getting all the sweet, all the candy, the butterscotch, the butter pecan, the nuttiness, the, the little hint of cherry right in the mid palate. And then as it hits the back of the palate, this is where you get the chocolate, little hint of spice there as well, but not a lot. I mean, let's go for another sip here. God, it's just so buttery and toffee. I mean, if you guys love just sucking on a Werther's Original candy or, uh, you know, just eating some, some kind of butterscotch candy or toffee, you will absolutely freak out over this. It's that, it's that strong. One thing I also really love about this is the, the, uh, the mouthfeel of it. It is extremely velvety. I mean, you wouldn't think of that 103.6 proof that it would be that, you know, that silky and that, that velvety on the palate. But I think it's still being cast strength and, you know, even being only 103.6 proof, you still get all the oils and everything from that barrel is still part of the whiskey. It's, it's, it's an elegant type of whiskey. This isn't a proof monster, as you guys know. This isn't going to knock you, you know, back with a bunch of like just flavor explosion. Doesn't have a long finish, but what you do get, this throwback bourbon that has all these great flavors that I've tasted before in, you know, bourbons from 60s, 70s, and 80s, but without like that musty funkiness to it, you know? If there was a uh, an example, now I've, I've said this term before, the modern dusty. If I've, if I've said that before about a couple of other bourbons that I've tried, this exemplifies that, probably none other than any bourbon I've tried. The, the modern dusty moniker, you could definitely call this bourbon. It's got everything you love about the old school with that entry proof, with the uh, using the heirloom grains, uh, using that really unique mash bill that McBrayer uh, put on the back of his letter when he sent it to E.H. Taylor, um, the non-chill filtered, all the stuff that we love, uh, but also keeping you know, the, a little bit of newness to it. It doesn't have that funkiness to it. It's more sweet. Uh, it's cherry, it's chocolate. It's got all those great flavors without all that musty funk that sometimes you find in those dusty bourbons. All right, so before I take my last sip, I want to mention for all you movie and TV buffs out there, uh, Old McBrayer was featured in the movie Untouchables and also was in the HBO series Deadwood. So if you watch those and you kind of go back and you, and you look, some of the whiskey bottles they were drinking actually had the McBrayer name on them. So, all right, last sip. It's great. I mean, it is the modern Dusty to the T. Uh, it's unique. It's different. It's not just sourced. It's, you know, they, they had the Brilliant Minds of Wilderness Trail uh, help them in, in creating this. And uh, I can't wait till there's more. So uh, let's do a quick recap. All right, guys. So final breakdown on this one real quick. Price is 100 bucks. Uh, I haven't seen any of these on the secondary. I think they sold out too fast, so could kind of skip that one. Um, as far as availability, it's very limited. Again, I will leave the link right below for you to join the Legacy Spirits Legacy Club to find out when the next batch is coming, if you like what you heard about this one. When it comes to value, I think $100 is even. I think it's an even value. It is where it should be. This will get older as we go forward, hopefully in the next batches as we see and see how this stuff ages. But uh, I'm not sure how old the second batch will be, but if it's, you know, even has a little bit more age than this with those butterscotch notes, you start implementing a little bit more oak uh, influence into that, uh, into that aging process and just taste it. I think sky's the limit for this. You can make the argument that there's stuff that's older that I could get a lot cheaper, and I get that. But really the uniqueness of this is what makes me okay with that $100 price point. And as far as I do, I recommend, I would happily recommend this. It's, I mean, this is a butter, scotch, butter, pecan, cherry, chocolate, all wrapped up. The only caveat is, is if you, if you like a long finish, this is not that. It doesn't have a long lingering finish. It is extremely creamy and velvety for something only a little bit over a hundred proof. But you know, if you like those flavors, I highly recommend it. If you're looking for something with more spice, a little bit of a longer finish, probably wouldn't be for you. 
All right, guys, well, hope you enjoyed this review for the first batch of the W.H. McBrayer Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey. It is a throwback bourbon. I absolutely love it. Um, if you did, hit the subscribe button below. Please hit that like button. If you haven't yet, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter. Let me know if you're one of the lucky few out there that got a bottle of this, if you got the same experience I did. Uh, keep an eye out for batch two. I want to thank them for allowing me to review this one. Uh, I you know, can't say thank you enough. Amazing story. Really great bourbon. I can't wait to see what happens down the line. As I always say, it's not about the whiskey. It's the people you share it with. Cheers, and I'll see you next time on The Mash and Drum. Take care, everybody.